Ah, this video brought to you by Magic Spoon, yes! If you've watched this channel for a while, you know that I'm a fan of cereal. Because, well, who isn't a fan of cereal? But cereal, while it is great, not always great for you. There were several years where I never ate that much because, well, usually it's just got way too much sugar that I don't need in my life. I mean, I don't have the healthiest diet in the world, but I generally keep an okay shape by not just eating tons of unnecessary sugar every morning, bowl after bowl. Anyway, along come Magic Spoon, and they're like, Yo, Simon, check this out. No sugar. Only five grams of net carbs per serving. That varies a little per box. Five is actually higher. That one's got four. Some others have three. And only 110 calories per serving. And I think, well, that's cool. Like, I don't know much about protein or carbs, other than that maybe the former is good for you and the latter not so much. But the zero sugar, that had me sold. It's also keto-friendly, gluten-free, low-carb, all of that good stuff. Now, originally they had four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. But then they also added some other ones, which were fantastic, peanut butter and cinnamon. And now there were some temporary flavors, like this one, maple waffle that they had, also cookies and cream. Yeah, that was the one I was showing right here. Uh, these were temporarily available, and now they're available all the time. Joyous. My favorite, definitely the cinnamon, which is sounding... Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty much gone. <laughs> anyway, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash geographics to grab a variety pack and try it all out. You can use my promo code geographics to get $5 off. Magic Spoon also has a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it, you get your money back. Perfect. And now today's video. Before Stonehenge, before the Great Pyramid at Giza, a monument was built on a tiny island in the Mediterranean that could rival anything in the ancient world. Carved from limestone, it didn't tower above the landscape of Malta, but rather sank into the earth, progressing downward through three great subterranean chambers. Down there in the dark, its creators toiled to create a work of pure art, an architectural wonder capable of instilling awe, not just through aesthetics, but through acoustic engineering that was light years ahead of its time. Known as the Hal Safdieni Hypogeum, or just the Hypogeum, the resulting building was unique within Europe, a structure far greater and far more complex than anything of its era. Yet for all its innovation, for all its raw power, the Hypogeum would almost be lost to history. Abandoned when Malta's temple culture collapsed around 2500 BC, the Hypogeum spent millennia sealed and forgotten, hidden beneath the parched ground. Only rediscovered in 1902, it instantly upended our understanding of Malta's ancient peoples, as well as giving us a glimpse inside a vanished culture of breathtaking ingenuity. Some 80 kilometers due south from sun-drenched shores of Sicily sits one of Europe's tiniest nations. Less than twice the size of diminutive Liechtenstein, Malta is little more than three tiny dots of land jutting out the Mediterranean, the sort of place you could utterly miss if you happen to blink while looking out of your window on an airplane. Yet this tiny country is home to riches other microstates could only dream of. It was here, thousands of years ago, that one of the world's great Neolithic peoples emerged. Known as the Temple Culture, they gathered centuries before the pyramids were even a seedy twinkle in some pharaoh's eye to build the biggest freestanding structures in prehistoric Europe. Of these, one would figuratively tower over the others, even as it literally plunged below the earth, the Hypogeum. The story of this remarkable necropolis begins so long ago that we might just as well flash up some fancy all-caps text on screen that reads, The Dawn of Time. If you want to be persnickety, though, it more precisely starts around 5000 BC, when a bunch of ancient farmers decided to give up Sicily for a new life on three tiny islands. Known collectively today as the nation of Malta, these islands were uninhabited at the moment the Sicilian boats touched their shores. Forested and vegetation-rich, they look completely unlike the stone ocean that makes up Malta's surface today. It didn't take long for the Neolithic farmers and their domesticated livestock to deforest the islands, leaving the semi-bare limestone that we'd recognize today. It's around this time that those same farmers started digging into the rock to build tombs. Now, since none of the temple cultures that made up ancient Malta left any written records, it's impossible for us to go into the 
why of all this. All we know is that during a period known as the Zbug phase, rock cut tombs started appearing, tombs that only got grander as Malta moved into the Begar period. But it was in the next period that things really went wild. Beginning around 3600 BC and known as the Gantia phase, the third period of the temple culture saw this era earn its name. It's within this period that the first highly complex Maltese temple appears, built from heavy stone blocks and internally carved to fit a symmetrical pattern. It's here that we start to see the typical features of temple culture buildings. The curved walls, seemingly designed to reflect their owner's underground burial chambers, the apses leading off the main space that were likely covered with incomplete domes. It's a good time to again point out that all of this was happening way way back. So far back that the Great Pyramid at Giza wouldn't be built for another thousand years. Heck, even Ireland's fabulously old Newgrange wouldn't be raised for another four centuries, equivalent to the amount of time separating you from William Shakespeare. Here the Maltese were, building away, constructing grand temples completely unlike anything else being built across the Mediterranean at that time. But the greatest of all would only come after the Gantia phase had ended. Beginning in 3300 BC, the Safliani period would last a mere 300 years, a mere blink of the eye in archaeological terms. But that would be enough time to give rise to a structure so mysterious, so awe-inspiring, that we're still talking about it over 5,000 years later. It's time we left the bright sunshine behind and descended deep underground to explore the Hal Safliani Hypogeum. Although it technically dates from the Safliani period, the earliest work we've yet uncovered on the Hypogeum began much earlier, like around the year 4000 BC. At this stage, though, it was simple stuff, a process of carving further into pre-existing caves that were being used to store the dead, part of Malta and Gozo's extremely ritualized approach to funerary rites. But it wasn't until sometime around 3300 BC that the nature of this work changed, that it became more elaborate, more precise, more beautiful. It would take centuries, but by the time time its builders were done, Malta would be home to one of the ancient world's greatest treasures. The work would have begun in what is today the uppermost chamber, closest to the surface. Effectively a low passageway leading to a courtyard with five burial chambers branching off it, the Hypogeum's upper level is one of the least elaborate, a place where funeral processions probably began. But if this entrance is a little underwhelming, the same can't be said of what comes next. Heading deeper, the Hypogeum opens out again into a place known as the Middle Level. If you've ever gotten all excited over pictures of the Hypogeum on Instagram, chances are they were taken in this part. This is the part where function finally gives way to formal excellence. It's on the second level that you find the so-called Holy of Holies, a grand temple carved directly into the limestone that's as awe-inspiring now as it would have been thousands of years ago. It's here, too, that the decorated room is found, with its geometric patterns painted onto the walls. The real prize, though, has to go to the Oracle Room. A long chamber, the Oracle Room lies below a ceiling painted with fascinating red spirals, as if someone had blasted Cy Twomley back in time, given him a brush, and told him to get on with it. Along with the patterns in the decorated room and down on level three, these are the only prehistoric paintings known to exist on Malta, a truly unique slice of local history. Yet it's not what you can see that makes the Oracle Room so hypnotic, but what you can hear. With brilliant precision, the ancient builders carved niches in the rocks that, taken with the room's oblong shape, allowed for all sorts of spectacular acoustic effects. Now, this sort of acoustic engineering wasn't unknown in the ancient world, but rarely was it done so early and so perfectly. For those living in an age long before the invention of things like Bluetooth speakers, the way sound traveled in the Oracle Room must have seemed somewhere between miraculous and terrify. Certainly, it would have given any ceremonies held there a haunting dimension, creating the feeling of a truly sacred space. Finally, below this space, stretching 10 meters underground, lies the youngest, lowest level. Consisting of small rooms with much smaller spaces coming off them, it's thought that this is where the processions ended, where the dead were stacked together in mass graves. Indeed, stacked seems to be the right word. The most commonly cited figure on the number of people buried here across the centuries is 6,000, although Heritage Malta claims this is likely an overcount. Still, there's no denying that the funeral customs of the Hypogeum's builders demanded the dead be laid together, not in individual plots, but in a communal house of death where bones would mingle even as memories of their owners 
decayed away into dust. Speaking of these owners, perhaps this would be a good time to shift our focus, to put the hypogeum itself to one side for a moment as we examine the most interesting question of all. Who really built it? So let's just get this out of the way right now. The answer to who built the Hypogeum is not aliens. Look, I'm sorry if you clicked on this video hoping to hear about elongated skulls and dudes from Niribu getting their kicks by making a bunch of Neolithic Maltese build shit for them. But honestly, attributing complex ancient structures to extraterrestrial visitors is probably the least interesting angle imaginable, one that serves only to erase the fascinating, complex, and little understood cultures that predated our own. And the people of Malta's temple period civilization were nothing if not fascinating. For about 1,500 years, they managed to not just survive on a trio of tiny islands, but thrive to the point where they could create over 30 grand temple complexes. While the Hypogeum is the best known and best preserved, there remain countless impressive above-ground ruins like at Hagar Kim or Tarxian. Seven are in good enough condition to have been declared UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and all of them reflect the same cultural fascinations with rituals and death. You can see this reflected in the physical designs. Many of the above-ground temples are laid out just like the Hypogeum and other underground necropolises, suggesting a link or a symmetry between the worlds of the living and the dead. Most of them are built at sites of freshwater springs with easy access to and sight lines towards the sea. This has led to some suggestions that the builders may have lived around the temples full time, making this forgotten religion the focal point of island life. It was a focus that involved one heck of a lot of sacrifice. At the Tarxian Temple, for example, we've uncovered the remains of so many domestic animals like sheep, goats, and pigs that the only explanation is that it was either the site of ritual sacrifice or ritual feasting. Interestingly, for an island nation, it seems seafood played no part in these rites. Isotope analysis of bones can detect telltale traces of diets rich in fish, and we're yet to find any from the temple period that contained these elements. Still, it seems the builders were healthy, with few missing teeth or showing signs of disease, even if for whatever reason they shied away from utilizing the most immediate source of food available to them. We also know that they were seriously into ritual sculptures. If you've read up on Malta's temple culture before, there's a good chance you've come across the fat ladies. Small figurines of large, corpulent women, often sitting or reclining, the fat ladies have been found in necropolises, usually as grave gifts. Some of them, such as the sleeping lady, are remarkable remarkable works of art. Others, such as the remains of a giant statue that once towered three meters over the Tarxian temple, or nearly ten feet if you prefer nonsensible measurements, showcase a kind of monumental style that suggests they may have been revered as goddesses. Since no other contemporary culture in the Mediterranean seems to have been making similar art, these works are justly famous. And yet they represent just a tiny fraction of the art the ancient Maltese were capable of. Alongside a sub-branch of the Fat Lady sculptures that seem to show decent androgynous figures, there are two main other human types, dressed and grotesque. The dress type are exactly what you'd expect. More realistic figures, often sexless, shown wearing formal clothing that may be related to status. The other type is far weirder. We found sculptures of human heads without bodies, only supported on legs that grow from their chins. Another shows a strange creature with the head of a pig, yet another seemingly shows a human head growing out of a gigantic penis. Speaking of phalluses, it seems there was a veritable smorgasbord of dongs in the temple period. Like many other ancient cultures, the temple period peoples worshipped representations of fertility, a worship encompassing phalluses and large-breasted ladies. But who exactly were the people doing that worshipping? What was their belief system? Why did they worship as they did? To answer that, we're going to have to tiptoe into the realm of speculation, albeit informed speculation. And it's important that you remember that, because as far as we can tell, these people lived their lives at the focal point of a strange and obsessive cult. Starting around the point the Hypogeum was constructed, the religious practices in ancient Malta seem to have graduated to full-blown 
death cults. We don't mean that in the sense of something like Heaven's Gate, a cult that actively courted death. We mean it in the sense that funerary practices and rites seem to have taken paramount importance within their culture. Back in the Zebug period, families have been buried together in simple alcoves hewn from rock, often in pre-existing caves. By the time the Tarxian phase got underway, though, in 3000 BC, death seems to have become some great communal celebration. There were the ritual feasts or sacrifices we mentioned earlier, not to mention the mere fact that a building as breathtaking as the Hypogeum seems to have only been used for burials. But the religious focus on death seems to go beyond that. As we near the end of the temple period, family burial seems to have vanished, replaced by great mass graves in which the bones were frequently separated and organized hundreds at a time. In some places, too, these mass graves seem to have been divided by gender, with women on one level with their grave gifts, while men are buried elsewhere without ritual figures or amulets. For some, this evidence that, when combined with the abundant fat lady statues, suggests temple period Malta was a matriarchal society, one where women were held in higher regard than men. While we can't say for sure this is right, we can assume that there was at least one caste that had more knowledge and likely more power than the other, the priests. One slightly weird fact about the temples and necropolises that we found so far is that the non-local items within them seem to have been hidden. For example, we can see that some green stones and pottery buried in these places were clearly not of Maltese origin. But rather than be displayed proudly, they're squirreled away in sanctums it seems unlikely common folk were allowed to visit. This raises one fact and one possibility. The fact is that the temple period peoples clearly traded with other civilizations, albeit on a small scale. The possibility, at least according to one source we read, is that only a select few knew about this. Now, the idea of a priestly caste hoarding all knowledge and keeping citizens in the dark about the existence of an outside world may sound a bit like Attack on Titan, but it's not impossible. Edo Japan, to give you just one example, managed to keep most of its inhabitants free of outside influences for centuries. Whether the priests were all powerful or not, though, is almost a moot point. We can see in the archaeological record just how much effort was spent constructing these temples, in comparison to more important-seeming staff like agriculture or terrace building. Clearly, temples took precedence over normal life, and that may have led to the society's eventual downfall. At some point in the late Tarxian period, as we go zooming towards the year 2500 BC, Several things seem to have happened at once. From what we can tell from the skeletal remains, diets seem to have gotten worse at some point, maybe due to some environmental pressure. Around the same time, the temples and the Hypogeum seem to have fallen out of use, to have been abandoned. Not long after, Malta's temple culture seems to have banished from history. We don't know what happened. All we know is that they stopped building, stopped making their art, and left behind no clear successor culture. While the Hypogeum would be modified again sometime before 1500 BC, it appears to have been done by a Bronze Age culture with no links to the temple builders. Maybe the food ran out, maybe an environmental catastrophe like a drought forced people from the islands, or maybe so many resources were devoted to the temple cults that wider society just couldn't take the strain. Regardless of the theories, the only fact is that around the same time as the Great Pyramid was being built in Giza, the temple builders shut up shop. Their great structures were abandoned, and the Hypogeum buried a Neolithic masterpiece, preserved and forgotten beneath the earth. It would be many millennia before anyone uncovered it again. In the end, it was being completely buried that preserved the Hypogeum so well. While weathering and the passage of time reduced the exposed temples to fragments of their former glory, the Hypogeum's sealed interior kept it at a steady humidity, one which stopped the stone from flaking. It also stopped humans from doing their worst. During the late 19th century, the industrialization of Malta led to whatever structure once stood above the Hypogeum being destroyed to make way for progress. Yep, it's that classic human reaction of, oh, look at this incredible ancient wonder. Ah, ah, just kidding. Let's knock it down and build a factory. It was an attitude that would nearly extend to the Hypogeum itself. The moment of discovery came in 1902. By then, Malta's ancient masterpiece had been locked away underground for thousands of years. Remember, when the temple cultures collapsed, it was still 2500 BC. That's so old that you, right now, are closer in time to Julius Caesar than Caesar was to the temple builders. We're talking 
a really long time here. So when workers in the Maltese town of Paola accidentally found the hypogeum while trying to dig a well, it should have been a historic moment, one that saw everyone stop and reflect. Instead, the construction company boss tried to cover up the discovery so work could continue unimpeded. It was a decision that would have all sorts of awful side effects. One was the hypogeum was essentially left open for a year, during which time locals made off with a whole lot of stuff inside, not realizing how valuable it was. Old, disintegrated piles of bones that could be analyzed, for example, are thought to have been carted away for use as fertilizer. For archaeologists, this emptying of the hypogeum was like someone finding a lost Shakespeare play and using it to mop up spilt fondue. It's not just annoying, it's actually stupid. Nor did things fare any better once the authorities got involved. Although ethnographist Father Emmanuel Magri was brought in to supervise proper excavations in 1903, he died suddenly in 1907 without giving anyone a copy of his notes. That means an incredible amount of things were removed from the hypogeum without any notation as to where they were found, meaning the location and possible uses of multiple objects will probably never be known. It was only when the epically named Sir Themistocles Zamet arrived on the scene that rigorous work finally began. A born archaeologist, Zamet did his best to seriously organize and catalog everything left in the hypogeum, creating a solid foundation for all the knowledge that we have today. It's thanks to him that more parts of Malta's ancient past weren't destroyed or lost. It's thanks to his work that we're able to make this video today. Sadly, it was work that would also be repeatedly misused. Among his notes, Zamet left a passing comment about some surviving skulls in the hypogeum being of the long-headed type. Now, Zamet was simply trying to classify the skulls according to the then-fashionable pseudoscience of chronology, something he wholeheartedly believed in. But since long-headed gives people the false impression of seriously giant craniums, and since we live in an age where ancient aliens is somehow classified as a documentary, that one sentence eventually led to the depressingly widespread theory that, yes, aliens built the hypogeum. Still, if having his work endlessly butchered on clickbait websites was the price Zamet had to pay to bring something of vital historic importance to the world, then so be it, because tune out the crazies and the structure he helped uncover is simply spectacular. Today, 120 years after it was rediscovered, the hypogeum remains awe-inspiring to contemplate. Here, on this tiny trio of islands to the south of Sicily, a culture arose before the dawn of recorded time that was unlike anything the Mediterranean had ever seen. Distant, obsessive, mysterious, they came together just long enough to give us one of the great engineering marvels of the ancient world before disappearing into the pages of history. And while we'll never know them, never get to hear their dreams, their desires, or learn what made them tick, we almost don't need to. Because the Hypogeum, like the above-ground temples they left, is both a relic and a mission statement carved in stone. A notice to all who had ever find it that this civilization once lived, and that its people had been capable of great things. No matter how many more centuries pass, the mere existence of this place means that we will never truly forget them. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.